What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined, as always, by my brother and the other great host of this show, Nick. And Nick, the draft, two weeks away. But first and most importantly, how are you, my good brother? Oh, I'm good, man. I am. Uh, I'm feeling good. I, we took a week off. We had a little vacation. I watched a lot of uh, XFL. I mean, uh, UFL. Uh, I watched the Michigan kicker from the Panthers drill two 62 yarders. So hoping the Rams have him on the phone. Yeah, you know what? We might talk about him in this episode. And XFL, UFL, The Rock, it's all the same thing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. At this point, you're just yeah, trying. But just while trying we have here, I just want to say to everybody watching, make sure that you like and subscribe, hit the buttons, leave a comment. We read every comment. It means so much to us that you guys you know, take the time to watch these episodes. But doing those things allows us to make more great content for you in the future. So please – Smash those buttons, as they say. Yeah. As the kids we, say. We only have two weeks until the draft. It's really come by really quick. It's like, oh, we were a month out. Now we're two weeks out. We took a little bit of a break. But it's all kind of come quick. And I think that we kind of wanted to set the table for this episode with a very important direct message. Because I thought <laughs> what happened was we were talking about the way that draft picks work with the cap. Right, because if you were to trade from number 19 all the way up to number seven or eight, you have to take into consideration what the potential cap implication could be. Right, it could be the difference of like 1.5 million dollars or whatever that number would be. So, Kevin Demoff slid into the DMs and said, "If we trade up, you have to factor the picks we give up and what they count against the cap. So any hit is reduced by what you give up. Just food for thought. Enjoy the work that you guys put out." Why is Kevin Demoff DMing us and talking about trading up? Well, first of all, Kevin, it means so much that you're a fan of the pod. It's a huge shout out. When Dean said a celebrity had reached into our DMs, I would have thought for sure he was talking about Angelina of the Jersey Shore fame, who is a devout follower of Rams Brothers. Look it up. It's true. She uh, has slid into the DMs, but I think she thought we were Odell Beckham Jr. No I, idea how, but... That would wouldn't put it past me. Or put that it makes me. it even better. Um, but I, it does. Kevin sliding into the DMs, uh, it makes you, it leads you to believe that it's like, why would he go out of his way to do that, if not to think that okay, let's just leave this little you know drop of water in this giant pond of potentially trading up because that's what it feels like. It feels like he's. He's Im- implying something, inferring something. And, it, you know, is he inferring Roma Duze? Potentially. Maybe. Potentially. And you know what? I didn't even want to do this. I didn't even want to trade up. I didn't want to trade up to number seven. I didn't want to have to give up all this draft capital, maybe even draft capital for next year, to be able to go all the way up to number seven in a scenario where the Chargers might take him at number five or whatever their draft pick is. He may even go before number seven. But as I was just looking at the Sean McVay offense – and how the offense just consistently remains priority under Sean McVay. The Rams have $182 million allocated to their offense right now. They're the only other offense that's more expensive in the NFL right now are the Cleveland Browns at $194 million. So they're second in terms of spending an offense. You look what they did in the offseason so far. Jonah Jackson, Kevin Dotson, Kobe Parkinson, Demarcus Robinson, Jimmy G, Tyler Johnson. They're all back on the books, a total of $38.25 million against the cap this year, still $11 million less than Matthew Stafford's 2024 cap hit of $49.5 million. But that's the way that this team is constructed. Sean McVay wants to be able to add dimensions, add layers onto his offense consistently every single year. And a player like Romo Dunze would be able to consistently take the top off. It adds another high volume target getter, another great red zone target, and a guy that simply does everything right. So that's kind of the methodology, even though it was kind of against the best practice of, okay, here's what's logical. Three defensive players go edge, interior defense tackle, and linebacker, or go interior defense tackle, edge and edge, or edge, edge and edge. You you need all of this to be able to uh, build a competent team. And I don't know if, you know, trading up for Romo Dunze for the majority of Rams feel like that is the right move to make. So that's why there was some hesitation. I think the Steve McVay combo is, it's like your buddy at the casino. It's like you go to the casino with them and you know, both of you are down like 300 bucks and you look at your friend and you're like, that's, that was the amount that I had set out to play with. So yep. I'm done. And your friend looks back at you and he's like, 
I'm pulling out 600 more dollars and I'm going back to the games and you're like, whoa, but that's, I, that's the methodology. It's like, we're good at what we do. We have yeah. setbacks, but we're going to prioritize what we know we're good at. And when you have Sean McVay, who is this offensive mind, yeah, allocate all the money towards the offense because and, and bring in new offensive weapons, hit the crafts table again, because that's what you're, that's what you were brought in for. This is right. this is the big show, and every single season you have these type of players. You want to be in the conversation of, all right, well, we have the best offense in the league, and when you have the best yeah. offense in the league, then <clears throat> likely will hopefully be in the in the Super Bowl conversation. Yeah, and and what's really interesting too is the way that they construct the defense because it's the total opposite. And it, it shouldn't really kind of come as a surprise considering what they did last year, but $62.5 million allocated to the defense. That's dead last in the NFL in terms of money allocated. They're second in offensive spending. They're dead last in, in terms of defensive spending, and that's including Aaron Donald's contract. But that doesn't mean that they didn't do some really nice things in the offseason. Darius Williams, three-year, $22.5 million. Uh, Cam Curl was, I think, widely considered to be one of the best free agency deals of 2024 thus far. Uh, Tredavious White, one year, eight point five million, still not on the on the books for over the cap. But then Christian Roseboom and Michael Hoyt, you know, two players that have continuity there. And I know that they were really interested in Andrew Van Ginkle from Miami, but Kevin O'Connell swooped right in and gave him that two year, twenty million dollar deal to pair him back with Brian Flores. I don't know if the Rams would have been as interested in a player like Trey White if they were able to get Van Ginkle under contract, just because of the way that the money works. But it's a very, very inexpensive defense. So the expectation should kind of be offense is going to carry defense is going to make a couple of plays, but for the majority, you need as many offensive weapons as you can possibly have because Matthew Stafford's in one of his final years and Cooper cup is aging and you want to, and you invested in the offensive line. You want to be able to put something uh, on the field, a product on the field this year that is going to be better than previous years. And I think the investment kind of steers you in that direction. So that's kind of where we're at. And then I wanted to uh, to talk about what the trade would look like if we were to invest in Romo Dunze, because everything's based on a value chart. So every single draft pick has a numerical value tied to it. So round one, seventh overall, 1,500 points tied to it. Um, but for the Rams, 19th overall, it's 875 points. And then the points drop off as you go. So obviously less points allocated to round three, 83rd overall to round five, 155th overall. But those are all the picks that I wanted to trade on top of a 2025 third round comp pick. So the estimation is like 2,500 points without including Tutu Atwell. If you wanted to include Tutu Atwell in the deal though, you could probably get to that magic number of 1,500 and the deal could go through. So in terms of roster calculus, sponsored by Tony Pastors, Romo Dunze, if he was drafted seventh overall, where I, I would project him to go, right? If you trade with the Titans, unless he goes to the Chargers at five, is a four four million six hundred and twenty nine uh, thousand four uh, four hundred and eighteen cap hit. So trading away nineteenth overall, eighty third overall, one hundred and fifty fifth overall, and a third round comp pick at twenty twenty five, that brings you to a total savings of four point six million. So the cap hit and the math all maths out. So that's exactly what we'd be looking for with the Roma Duze trade. And then after the trade, this is what you'd be left with. Round one, seventh overall. Round two, 52nd overall. Round three, 98th overall. Round five, 154. And then round six, you have 195, 209, 213, and 217. And then round seven, you have 254. So that's the basis of where we're going to go with this mock draft. We're going to go through it pretty quickly, probably 20 minutes or so. But that's the starting point of this is all the math you'd have to do to be able to just acquire that seventh overall pick and the way that they've invested and the message we got from the COO of the Rams kind of led us in a pretty interesting direction. Yeah. I, it, when he, you know, when he talks to you directly, you're going to listen. It, <laughs> it makes sense like to think, or it's like, all right, so this is what we had in mind. Now let's see it, you know, from this completely other perspective. And it's also, we have a couple of weeks just to, you know, play the cards and see the numbers and see exactly how it would look like. But just yeah. from the standpoint of you're potentially bringing in talent with uh, Rome, Rome, uh, sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going to mispronounce the name a bunch of times. Uh, that is Rome. Just, like, just Rome, just Rome, just Rome. That is going to like, think of, 
so Cooper Cup and Puka Nakua, both of them were late round draft picks. If you yep. can get one of these guys that is going to be like a key contributor and not just a key contributor, but like, you know, Van Je- sorry, not Van Jefferson, Justin Jefferson. Oh, no, yeah, like Justin Jefferson. Okay, yeah, I know where you're going. Devontae yeah, Adams, Larry Fitzgerald. Yeah, I see. Yeah, that. like with Matthew Stafford, who can blow the top off while you still have Puka Nakua doing like kind of like shorter out routes. That is a whole different team. And it's a lot of it's you know, it's it it's very exciting. So while it may seem controversial and you know, not happy like in the terms of what Rams fans want to get, especially after losing Aaron Donald, there is always going to be a, like a cap size of the upside with this, you know, with a player like that. And then with the front office and head coach that we have. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, Romo Dunze would be that draft pick that everybody would be obsessed with because he is a high volume target getter. He does everything that you would want him to do. I think he's a top five player in this draft. And I think I mentioned I'm concerned about the Chargers potentially taking him, but he's a master at his craft. Like I see a player who's extremely good in every single area when it comes to the wide receiver position, he's going to transcend the offense. He's a true X receiver. You got to think like Odell Beckham Jr. in 2021, unpredictability and mismatches in the secondary consistently. And you got to take into account, you know, Demarcus Robinson and Tutu out well in the final years of their deal. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So after Romo Dunze, we're left with the 52nd pick in the draft. So Adisa Isaac, this is a player that we already mocked. And I think this may be the best story in the draft. Like this is a player that is very much on the path to, I would say, Walter Payton, man of the year, the next Byron Young. Like this is the player, if you want a guy who cares, like he's an adult. He raised three brothers and a sister who all had disabilities growing up, a single mother. He spent 20 hours a week working through college, interning at state high school, earning $10 per hour working with kids with disabilities. And as a football player, he's also really good. He rushed the passer at you know roughly 160 degree angle. If you got your protractor out, he led Penn State with 7.5 sacks in 2023 and 16 tackles for a loss. Like that team captain who acted as a go between when coaches and players weren't connecting. So that's kind of you know where I'd want to be able to uh, to lean in the second round. If you can go edge, you're still prioritizing the defense in a way that you need to with the next three picks that we have on the board. And it's a player that I really likes not getting a ton of attention. And, you know, you saw Chop Robinson on the Rams' front page on Twitter today, which was pretty interesting. So I know that they're looking at Penn State. And I think Adisa Isaac is the player that's kind of falling under the radar more so than a lot of these edge rushers in the draft. Just a, an adult that can come in and, and play really good football right away. I, but Penn State also as well is they they bring out a lot of really good players. And, and yeah. with listing all the stuff that you said about, like, you know, his single mom, three brothers, they help raise them. It just reminds me of that uh, Reba meme where it's like a single mom who worked three <laughs> jobs, loves her kids, but never stops. <laughs> yeah, great. I'm I mean, a survivor. Yeah, exactly. Also, I mean, it would be very, very like kind of a relief if they just went boom, like trade up offensive weapon. And then, OK, immediately we're, we're going to address the edge because that is our number yeah. one problem. And then we're going to settle in and, and draft some more defensive players. So yeah. the next player, so I, I, I know somebody's going to comment this. I know somebody's going to comment and say, Michael Hall Jr. is not going to be available with the 98th pick overall. You can go to PFF. You can look at his average draft position in every single mock draft. Guess where it is? 98th overall or 99th overall, somewhere in that range. This is a player that is 6'3", 290 pounds, and can take a lot of the stress off of Kobe Turner's plate as a three-tech. And he's going to demand attention right away. Kobe Turner, when Aaron Donald was on the field, played a lot of nose guard and a lot of nose tackle. And that's, you know, Bobby Brown wasn't the kind of player that could stay on the field consistently. So you got a lot of Kobe Turner and Aaron Donald tandems. Uh, I would like to see a little bit of Michael Hall and Kobe Turner on the field at the same time. This is a player that could own the three tech while Kobe kind of moves around on the defensive line. And I think he's really, really good at getting leverage. He's a little bit taller at 6'3". But in terms of his initial explosiveness and lateral bursts, like that's what makes him so good at consistently winning against guys that are heavier and stronger than he is. He, for some reason, he just feels like he's going to be a Ram. It's something about, I don't know if it's the motor, it's the consistency, 
Uh, it just feels like this is a football player that just wants to come in and do business. He can beat isolation run blocks instantly with quick and violent swim moves. You look at his highlights. A couple of his swim moves are violent. He throws people out of the way. He's really, really twitchy. He knocks blockers off balance and he can get engulfed with some larger tackles and some larger guards and centers at times. Um, but he's a player that I feel like you just add a little bit of coaching to, and he's going to be a bona fide contributor for the defense. So Michael Hall, I really, really liked, and I hope yeah, he falls. I, 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 once again, offense huge and a defense defense. It we may have been living in a fantasy world when when we did our first mock draft where we said defense, defense, defense to start because I. It, it, Thinking about it now, after receiving a DM from the Pied Piper himself, Kevin Demoff, it it does lead you to believe that okay, maybe we were kind of living in a bit of a fantasy we don't, world. Yeah, we don't know if it's definitively going to happen, but it, no. it at least got us. It at least got us thinking, right? And you know, yeah. another thing with Michael Hall is uh, he's one of the youngest players in the entire draft. He's only 20 years old. He's going to be 21 in June. So you're getting a really, really solid prospect alongside of a kid that already has a has a son, but is a professional and wants to continue to grow his personal as he uh, comes up into the league. So a guy that I really, really like and appreciate in Michael Hall. The next draft pick, we went defense again. So we went offense, defense, defense, defense. And I think that that makes a lot of sense after you made the splashy move on Romo Dunze. Jalen Ford, this is my eventual Christian Roseboom replacement. I think he plays in rotation with Christian Roseboom right away. And it's my effort to eventually replicate the Patrick Queen and Roquan Smith tandem that we saw in Baltimore last year that was so damn effective all throughout the postseason. Um, he has experience calling the defense at the Mike Linebacker position at Texas, but he I don't think he's good enough to necessarily own it at the pro level, so he's never going to be a threat to replace Ernest Jones. But I feel like he can take over if Ernest Jones is out for any reason and call the defense because he has the experience to do so. He also pursues the ball with really, really good pace, and I feel like he's become more and more of a steady, steadier tackler in the open field as the years have progressed. And we know Les Snead likes these Texas guys who have these high motors, have great hands, have third down value, maybe a little bit of lack of consistency, but he's also a really solid special teams player and he could add value there immediately. So I would be really happy if you ended up with Adisa Isaac, Michael Hall Jr. and Jalen Ford all back to back to back going into round five, pick 154. I think, you know, you, you brought in four players just in five rounds, traded away some capital but you brought, I feel like, four prominent names that are going to be impactful almost immediately to this team. So Yeah, I, I think you kind of need players in these first rounds if you're going to keep all of those picks that are going to be able to start on the team. And then kind of, yeah. you know, after that, it gets a little wishy-washy if they're going to, you know, be able to make it past, uh, you know, the summer and whatnot. But sure. still, uh, I think – somebody from Texas similar to Penn state where it's just, you, you have the culture immediately and it's just to keep it on defense for three in a row after Rome would just be it once again, potentially maybe asking too much. <laughs> well, the next pick I went back to the offense and I wanted to find another offensive lineman that has extensive starting experience and really, really good technique and somebody that could eventually replace Rob Havenstein. I found Walter Rouse out of, uh, out of Stanford. He's an offensive tackle. Uh, pass sets are, are really patient, and I think he's really well-balanced. His legs are absolutely massive. Um, he gives really, really good effort um, getting to his landmarks on the backside cutoffs. He keeps his feet moving. He stays connected with his blocks. He's a, he's a smart player, and I feel like he's the kind of guy that can come in. You have to eventually address um, the offensive line and who is going to eventually replace Albert Jackson and Rob Havenstein. I feel like they've tried to do it in years past with players like Warren McClendon and Trayman Akram. But it's it's difficult. Like it's a lot of the time they start these guys inside, try to work them outside, and by the time they work them outside, they're just overmatched by really really talented edge rushers. So I would like to have somebody like this, somebody from Stanford that has the the smarts, the ability to eventually come in and replace a player like Rob Havenstein, who I think is going into his eleventh year with the Rams. His final, he's the last Ram that holds on yeah. to the St. Louis, uh, you know, check mark. So I. It's wild that he's still on the team, and to to be thinking about his replacement, I think is is a really good idea. 
Uh, especially, yeah. I mean, also just from how crappy our offensive line luck has been, especially the year after the Super Bowl. But like, it's just smart just to have rotational guys that if somebody does go down, you can kind of have somebody that you can kind of plug into a bunch of different spots. Yep, exactly. And that's the kind of player that this is. And, you know, those guys, Akram, um, I think he signed with Seattle, you know, um, and then Warren McLennan, I think he's still on the roster, but like they don't, you know, they eventually go on, their contracts expire, they go sign elsewhere. You have to kind of replace and get ready for the future. The next draft pick I took is another offensive player, but this is a secret weapon. Tyrone Tracy Jr., running back from Purdue. He didn't play a lot of running back in college, but he is a running back. He's being drafted and evaluated as a running back. He was only a full-time back for one year, but he flashes all over the field. Like you could line him up at any single position and he could be one of those gadget players just because he's so bendy, he's so rhythmic when he runs. And <laughs> this quote from uh, Lance Erlin I thought was really interesting. Um, he traverses the interior run lanes like he built the maze. So he's one of those little kind of like scat back, really difficult to tackle, difficult to get down running backs. Um, and he's able to create that additional yardage with his blend of elusiveness, power, and willful desire to maximize each run. You know, he kind of reminds me of a little bit of Isaiah Pacheco when he runs the ball, has the ball in his hands. You know, somebody that runs angry, but is, you know, going to be counted out. It's going to be drafted really, really late. We have good, took him with the 209th pick in the sixth round. Um, but he's going to, you know, be a, a gadget player in the NFL. And I think he's going to intrigue a lot of teams who want to get a little bit more out of their backfield and get a little bit of pop in their offense earlier on in the game. He's that kind of player who, if you don't account for him, he could slip out of the backfield. He can catch a wheel route and take it 65 yards down the field. But he's also a player that if you needed to put him in short motion and put him in the slot, he could also do something like that. So I, I really just admire a running back who's has that kind of diversity. He's not just a, you know, one cut every down running back guy that can play a little bit of receiver, take some pressure off of Kyron Williams. So and we, you know, Purdue basketball is playing tonight. Jim Everett's alma mater, who's floating behind me, if you could see him in that poster. We like kids from Purdue. We liked kids from Purdue last year, and we don't think we took any. So that would be uh, yeah, my thing. Anytime. anytime you can have a running back that can run that little Todd Gurley play where it's, you know, it's a fake handoff and he just goes all the way around the like back of the end zone. Um that's a personal favorite of mine. I think they ran, ran that with Daryl Henderson in the 2021 Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the pass catching running backs are such a threat. And, yeah, you know, Kyron, yeah. well, I think Kyron bobbled a couple last year. I mean, he's a pretty good pass catcher, but like it wouldn't hurt if you just wanted him to focus on getting yards on the ground. So, yeah. I, and he's fully capable of that as well. But that those are the kind of things that kind of push somebody, you know, yeah. like a player like this, this deep in the draft kind of push him over the edge. Yeah, I still like Audric Estime from uh, from Notre Dame, who we talked about in the last episode, Thunder and Lightning. You know, that that kind of fun out of the backfield is still very much in play, but you'd probably have to invest a higher draft pick in a player like that. And I really like the offensive tackle that we took. So I stuck with that. And then Brennan Jackson is a player that we've talked about in the past from Washington State. Um, more edge help. We talked about Brennan Jackson being a player that in rotation with Byron Young, I feel like could be effective with Adisa Isaac and Michael Hoyt on the other side. Uh, I think we need two of these players, to be honest. And this is a player that I feel like really good bend, powerful hips. He's one of those underrated players in the draft, but, you know, has, uh, you know, ties to advancing. You know, he's been really good every single year as the years have progressed. And I think he, um, he wants to be, you know, a great pairing, great rotational player with a player like Michael Hoyt or Byron Young. And I, I you know, you love a, a motor in a guy like that. And Brennan Jackson is just a guy we looked at, took in the previous draft, took him again in this draft. And I wanted to make sure that we had him on the roster for next year, just because I like him as a player. Um, the next pick we took, Round six, 217. This, <laughs> this was one of my favorite draft picks because he is just a monster. Evan Anderson, interior defensive tackle from Florida Atlantic University. He had an 89.9 run grade in 2023 out of 363 snaps. That was the sixth best in college football. And we talked about Bobby Brown already. I feel like he could bring some legitimate competition, competition to, uh, to Bobby Brown. Look at his legs in the picture. Like yeah. he is just a massive, massive human being, six, five, 350 pounds, uh, really, really solid height and weight legs, strong upper body. 
Um, he's the kind of guy that displays really, really solid use of his hands and power at the point of attack. You could tell he's a powerful player, but his play strength is very, very solid. And he's right. <laughs> Look at this guy trying to block him one on one. He's really hard to move off of the line of scrimmage in a double team. And, you know, you want some more beef on the defensive line. You want some more attitude. You want some more ability on the defensive line. And I think between, you know, Kobe Turner, Brennan Jackson, Adisa Isaac, Michael Hoyt, Byron Young, Bobby Brown, like you've got a lot of talent up front and they're young and they're hungry. So that's I mean, kind yeah, of the methodology there. They're looking to fill in the roles of Aaron Donald. I mean, Evan Anderson just looks like one of those guys at the gym who you see him on the leg press machine and it's like, <laughs> bro. You can't fit any more 45s on there, man. It's, it's maxed out. Like maybe you could throw some on the top, but there's no guarantee they're going to make it all the way down. Those guys can bench 405, 495, like just, I mean, four plates on each side, five, but keep loading them up. Like those guys can just rep them out. And, you know, you like that in a nose tackle, a guy that can take on a double team and spring a guy like Kobe Turner free and allow him just to get the one-on-one -on -one opportunities that Aaron Donald dreamed about his whole career. That's what I would like. So it's another play that we just, I feel like we stole, like we stole a couple of these guys in the back end, like Tyrone Tracy Jr. That's a steal. Uh, Evan Anderson, interior defense tackle out of Florida Atlantic. That's a steal. Um, guy that can contribute right away. The next pick, I mean, <laughs> you know, you go Ben Skoranek, you go Jacob yeah. Harris. Like he's very much in that ballpark. Um, Isaac Rex, tight end from BYU. Round seven, pick 254. He gets a really, really quick release off the line of scrimmage. Um, he's pretty lanky. He's long-armed. He's a big guy, but he's broad shoulders, and he can carry weight, and he can play special teams, and he was a national high jump champion in high school. So the athleticism translates into the pass game. Has ties with Puka Nakua from BYU. Very, very good speed for the position, and I think that he has that second gear to be able to accelerate and be that big play threat. And I wanted somebody that looked a lot like Colby Parkinson in terms of size, um, because, you know, if you have somebody that plays in rotation or opposite of him, you want to be able to disguise things on either side and just create tons and tons of mismatches, right? Because you don't know which ways the play is going. And both of these guys can block consistently and run great routes. Um, that's what you want from your tight end room. And it's something that you haven't had. Like you're looking for Bryson Hopkins and Kendall Blanton and some of these other backup tight ends that we've had that we almost had to bring back. I think they waived Kendall Blanton and they brought him back for the 2021 playoff run. Like that kind of stuff happens all the time if you don't have enough tight end depth. So we know what's going on with Higgs and what's going on with the uh, Hunter Long. So you got to right. make sure you have some security there. With Higby out for you know, potentially, well, I think it was three weeks. To, to yeah, start. he's going to be on the on the pup list, I think, for the first three or four weeks, something like that. Yeah, yeah. and also Isaiah Rex, just the name of a special teams player. You know, pitch yeah. Isaiah Rex. Oh, <laughs> touchdown! Benny Sko putting his his wing right around him and uh, showing him everything he needs to show him about special teams. I think that's the kind of player that we'd be looking for. And then when was the last time the Rams re returned a punt? I don't know if that ever happened. I don't know. I mean, I was the hoping last, like, that twenty years. I mean, obviously it has, but well, I mean, I'm trying to think like over the last ten maybe years, maybe like twenty seventeen well, against Stedman the Jaguars. Stedman Bailey did it. I remember. I think in like twenty sixteen or seventeen. I think it was uh, maybe. Like oh, wait, Powell. Wait, Powell did it. Oh, yeah. Against the Vikings, Powell. 2021. Yeah. 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 Somebody, was, somebody was literally about to type that in the comments. Dina Nick, you forgot about Brandon Powell. Jesus. Yeah. I know. I was oh, waiting for that. I was waiting for that. And then as the draft wrapped up, they <laughs> left this. I, mean, I don't even think you could draft this kid, right? Because, I mean, he's. I, I mean, I guess you could. Why not? He's in the UFL. Um, Jake Bates, kicker out of UFL, Michigan, which I think was the old team that Jeff Fisher used to coach and then got fired. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So, so last week, Jake Correct. Bates, yeah, yeah. Jake Bates led the Michigan Panthers, Jeff Fisher's old team, to victory by draining a 64-yard field goal in the final seconds of the game. I think every Rams fan that has a phone was like, oh, my God, Jake Bates. We got to get Jake Bates. Bring in Jake Bates. And it was his first field goal attempt since high school. Like that was the context that everybody was missing. It was like, we haven't let this guy kick since high school. And now he's on the UFL main stage blasting 64 yarders. What are we missing? He struck gold again. 
during this past Sunday's game between the Panthers and the Birmingham Stallions to close the first half. Jake Bates nails a 62-yard field goal. I mean, this dude's clock, but it was perfect. I mean, it, it it's remarkable that I can sit here at my desk and watch the games, like, and just say week after week on this podcast, twice a week because we do two during the season. There is talent in the XFL, in the USFL, in the UFL, whatever you want to call it, and like these guys, like, bring them in for a tryout. Stop sure. going yeah. to like you know kickers that you formerly like uh, you fired previously fired like I know. look at look at the tape and then immediately to start the season this kid drills 260 yarders <laughs> nick though why, why don't we pump the brakes for a second cuz i really want you to read that last bullet point that sits under the quote about the birmingham stallions and how he just nailed a 62 yard field goal Oh, yeah, right, right, right. True, true, true. You brought this up before we record it. He's the first f- uh, field goal kicker since Brett Maher in 2019 to make 60 <laughs> yards in consecutive weeks. Wait, wait. Since who? Brett, Brett Maher? Maher, yeah. Uh, you know, but that doesn't, I mean, what does that really mean? I think it's just a coincidence, the fact that that stat came together. But, like, yeah, bring him in for a tryout. I mean, why not? You need a kicker. Um, I think we talked about Joshua Cardi from Stanford and I saw him getting mocked in a bunch of drafts after the fact. So, Hey, at least you guys are listening. It's good kicker. Um, I'm, I think there were a couple of other Harrison Mavis, a couple of others kickers are so damn hard to evaluate. Let's bring back Sam Sloman. No, I'm just kidding. We want Jake Bates, Jake Bates from the Michigan Panthers uh, to come in and kick. Yeah, they, for in. Bring in Jake Bates. I know that and no offense to anybody at the, at the, at the XFL, but um the stage couldn't be smaller at an XFL game. Let's be real, you know, but still, I mean, like game ending kick, like, you know, you're putting the team on your back. The Michigan Panthers also are a historically bad franchise and like, are like, they beat the St. Louis battle Hawks who are like kind of the, you know, the cream of the crop of this XFL situation. So yeah, yeah. they, you know, two, two huge kicks. So it's just something to look, look into. I know I seem like, you know, a harebrained goofball all the time, but, it, you know, I, I I say some smart things every third <laughs> No, you, you do. You do. So why don't you give us a grade for each of our draft picks? We'll recap them real quick. Romo Dunze. Okay. <laughs> Let's go A. All right. I'll give you an A for that one. I totally agree. I think he is the next Devontae Adams. And if you add him with Sean McVay, he's going to light the world on fire. How yeah. about Adisa Isaac, edge out of I'm Penn gonna State? I'm going to go – this is bad because I, I, you know, I love all of them. I'm, I'm also going to say A. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is our own mock draft. We're grading our right, own mock draft. Exactly. <laughs> all right. So we'll just go through them. Adisa Isaac, Michael Hall uh, with the third round, 98th pick. Um, Jalen Ford, round five, pick 154. Walter Rouse, round six, pick 195. Tyrone Tracy Jr. in the sixth round, pick 209. Brennan Jackson, round six, pick 213. Evan Anderson, round six, pick 217. Isaac Rex, seventh round, pick 254. And then we also brought in Jake Bates. And these were the final, <laughs> and these were the final draft picks that we were able to hold on to after trading the 19th overall pick up to number seven with the Tennessee Titans. Last time we traded up with the Titans, we ended up in the Super Bowl in like two years. So Jared. He went to Jared, and he delivered for a couple of years until they went to Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> and then we know who delivered in the clutch moments. All right. That's a podcast for another day. We love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Um, fun as always. These draft episodes are a freaking beast. I texted Nick. I was like, this is a freaking monster from hell, this episode, all these graphics and shit. But we appreciate you. We love that um, you guys are so in tune with all the draft stuff. And make sure to comment your thoughts, like, and subscribe. You got anything to add to the podcast? You like prospects specifically? You want to grade a specific draft pick? It's all welcome. So, Yeah, you know, reach out to Dean and I, direct message. And clearly they're open. Um, Kevin, appreciate <laughs> you. We're, we're huge fans of yours as well. Yep, yep. Take care, guys. We love you. And go Rams. Go Rams. Peace.